This is a Momentum Media production. You're listening to HR Leader, inspiring you to lead the workforce of tomorrow. Hello and welcome to the HR Leader. I'm Shandell, I'm the editor here at HR Leader. And I'm very excited to be joined today by Bodo Mann. Bodo is the CEO and MD of Auticon in Australia and New Zealand. Welcome, Bodo. Thank you very much, Sundell. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. I'm looking forward to having a chat today about what Auticon is all about and how you know your approach is a little bit different to maybe other organizations. So I think the best place to start is maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the history of Auticon and what its mission really is. I would love to. Thanks. So Articon is a social enterprise. We were formed 11 years ago. At the time, it was a German entrepreneur whose son was on the spectrum. And he felt disenchanted with the career outlook to job prospects for people on the spectrum. So he set it up as a social enterprise, focusing very much on IT-related topics. So um, there are four, four verticals we're talking about. So there's software engineering, there's quality assurance and testing, there's data analytics. And more recently, we started to invest in the cybersecurity space. So those four verticals. And what does make us unique, we have this 360 support model, uh, which entails some um, job coaches, some of them are psychologists, some other ones are many years long, long-term practitioners working with people on the spectrum, as well as we have some tech leads. And those job coaches provide some mission-critical coaching for the consultants as well as for clients. And that's the reason why we can, over a longer period of time, guarantee a productive outcome for all parties involved, whether it's the client side as well as uh, or, or the, the consultant. Mm-hmm. Now, Auticon has you know branched out and uh, grown internationally. So originally, obviously, in Germany, but we are now in four European countries, the UK, France, Switzerland, and Italy. Uh, four years ago, we went across the Atlantic in the US and in Canada. And three years ago, we started our business in Australia. And it coincided with Sir Richard Branson coming out to Australia, who's one of our shareholders, by the way. And uh, since then, we've been growing now to nearly 25 consultants uh, in Australia. And we're just about to set up our business in New Zealand as well. Mm. So it's very exciting. Wow. And without, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, so without having to name names, I'm curious about the sort of feedback you've had from clients in the market. What do people say about why they choose to work with you? So the, the feedback is, I mean, generally very positive. It's very encouraging. And either we come through like the senior execs or to the board, um, but typically we have the coming from the technology side or the HR side. So the diversity and inclusion side. So it's very positive. However, it does take uh, somewhere six to 12 months until we have a consultant, one, two or three consultants then actually successfully, you know, set up and actually working with with the client within the client environment. Mm-hmm. And from my perspective, uh, you do hear a German accent, but you know, 23 years here in, uh, in Australia. So I believe we are probably three years behind Europe when it comes to embracing disability in general, uh, mm-hmm. specifically neurodiversity. It's too often still regarded as an NDIS topic or a charity topic. So we, we have this new and fresh approach, um, and certainly clients or potential clients and any partner, they love the idea, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of foundation work to be done and a lot of conversations to help them understand that it is not a charity, but it's actually much more a productivity and an innovation topic. Mm-hmm. So overall, very positive because there's no other company in the world with that singular focus on neurodiversity as well as for-profit. So that was something I wanted to delve into a little bit more, just the differences between charities. Because obviously, you know, there's some similarities in terms of goals there, but you've set yourself very much up as a, a commercial organization, right? Yeah, that's correct. And we want to prove, you know, to our clients, to the world, and to all the involved parties out there that you can actually create a profitable enterprise. You know, down the track, we would love to, you know, explore an IPO. Mm. But the idea is really to to drive this paradigm shift that you can actually have a profitable enterprise as well as a social impact. Because clearly our you know, mission is like uh, having this dual approach. Mm. We want to change lives for obviously autistic uh, talent and individuals, but as well as for society. 
But on the flip side, we want to drive that through, you know, tangible value generation. And if we can prove it, then hopefully, you know, uh, we, we can be, you know, inspiration for other organizations to try to do the same in other areas, right? Because it really gets to the heart of what diversity, equity, and inclusion is all about, right? It's finding yeah. the right work for people where they can offer value, where the business gets value from them as well. And as you said, you've got the right support in place to make sure that both sides there are really getting the best out of the relationship as well. I, I agree. And I think the you know the time is right for that. And if you look at globally, the ESG movement, there, there's a, there's a new conscience which is you know awakening all around the world, and I think we certainly benefit from that as well mm. uh, in our space where we obviously represent the S, and uh, it's time to give that a real go and just like prove that it can be done. Right? So and so far so good, right? Over the last eleven years, have been sort of been growing steadily. Mm. Uh, COVID didn't help, but uh, we managed our way through that as well. Mm. And uh, the need is there, right? Um, and there's so much more we can do. Now, the fact that you know there's like a, a war on talent or there's not enough skilled labor available does help us in a sense to pop up on the radar screen as an alternative talent source to fill that skill gap. We still have the challenges, as I talked about early on, mm-hmm. but um, it does help us in the sense that we are considered and we have more conversations than ever. And how long, sorry, have you been in the Australian market for? So three and a half years. Uh, we basically opened the office here and um, we have been basically we established ourselves in Sydney first and then we moved uh, uh, to Melbourne. We're pretty much like the offices are not the same size, which is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, we have a few consultants in Brisbane and Perth. But in terms of formal office space and uh, footprint, it's certainly in Melbourne and Sydney. And then yeah. going forward, it will be Auckland as well. And I, I would imagine in the way we work these days that anyone across Sydney and soon New Zealand will be able to work with you, right? Like we can do these things remotely as well. Is that right? Yeah, spot on. And so so that's probably the other benefit out of the pandemic and a lot, a lot of good things I can I can think of when we're talking about the pandemic. But the ability to work remotely and the acceptance is obviously we all benefit from in terms of working from at home or anywhere else. Mm. And so that helped our consultants as well. So you know, absolutely, we do serve clients uh, remotely across, you know, interstate and as well across Tasman. We will do that going forward. Mm. However, our ambition is to actually establish a formal office and a business in New Zealand with New Zealand consultants. But the idea is that, yeah, absolutely, we can serve projects and we can serve clients uh, across Tasman by just working remotely. And have you found that giving that opportunity to people who are on the autism spectrum to work remotely has actually helped open up talent pools a little bit more as well? I think it has because obviously companies are craving for, particularly for technology talent, and by introducing basically a new form of talent um, and as well as providing a lot of training and awareness, um, we did create basically a new space there. And typically the reaction we get from clients, uh, they had really no idea or there was a fair bit of anxiety around how to deal with people on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Once we alleviated that and we provide that training and uh, created these introduction and the coaching, mm-hmm. the reaction is amazing in terms of, oh, we had no idea. It's just an amazing outcome. They're very well integrated, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And it works. Now, I think it becomes more mainstream as well. If you look at the Love on the Spectrum on Netflix, right? the, the the show, which is obviously super popular, not just here, but in the US as well, yeah. people talk about autism and it becomes much more mainstream. And so that's help, that helps us as well. Um, but typically there's still, you know, there's a lot of ground, a lot of opportunities we should go after. We're speaking with Bodo Mann, the CEO and MD of Autocon in Australia and New Zealand. We'll be back on the other side of this break. And we're back with Bodo. We've been talking about Auticon in Australia primarily and and expanding out to New Zealand soon as well. And just a little bit about the history of the organisation, how it differs from charities. And what I'd like to sort of delve into next with you, you mentioned obviously you've got quite a strong presence overseas. What do you think Australia can learn from the overseas arms of, of your business and what areas do we really need to catch up on? I think, I mean, there are a few areas, but uh, in tech France or the UK, for example, some of the legislations uh, are much more in favor for disability. So corporates are supported if they do invest in the disability sector or, or in neurodiversity um, as well. 
France, for example, has a penalty if there's not a certain quota fulfilled by corporates. And so that quota, for example, works in our favor because should they work with us, we get basically credited for mm-hmm. our companies get credited. Um, so th- these are little things which do help. But generally speaking, I think take the UK mm-hmm. over decades, it's like the awareness uh, around disability is, has been much bigger than what it probably has been in Australia. So there's like a, you know, probably a societal change which has to happen and we're catching up. I agree. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's a fair bit of work still to be done. And and I believe Australia probably came a long way when it comes to like gender diversity mm-hmm. or LGBTIQ. Indigenous is picking up a lot, uh, which is more fantastic. But it feels like that neurodiversity is the next frontier and there's much more we, we can do. But uh, certainly Europe is ahead of the curve and the US is actually picking up nicely as well. So really, my ambition is like to show the world that we are leading, actually. And uh, if we achieve that, it creates opportunities for everyone. And it's better for literally for everyone, just uh, society as well, consultants and corporates. Yeah. Because I strongly believe if if you look at innovation, right, so the holy grail for corporate success is really innovation. And the way to get innovation is really the ability to think differently. So form teams with different skill set and different ways of approaching a problem. Mm. And by definition, like neurodiverse talent uh, does that, you know, way different from non-autistic uh, employees. Mm. And so it's all around that healthy balance and that healthy mix. And that's why we're focusing so much on the innovation topic. I think what you're saying there in terms of the Australian market being very focused on some particular areas of diversity is true. I think there's been a lot of talk around gender, which is great. I think that we're talking more around cultural and racial diversity as well. But I haven't seen a lot around neurodiversity. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have this chat today, because, as you said, there, there's a great opportunity there. Um, and perhaps if we can learn from some of our overseas you know, partners as well, that would be really great. Yeah, so I think that a lot of so what one of my some of my colleagues overseas did very well. They established some strong relationships with uh, medical uh, practitioners, with universities, with governments as well. And so uh, I, I basically, you know, used those ideas, those good ideas, and just like we try to implement them here as well. And you know, also to to federal politics, uh, state politics. Because every bit helps, right? And certainly on the PR, on the media side, one of our strategy is like to do good things, but talk about it as well. And so we, you know, this partnership with our clients, we go out and, you know, have articles out there or do, uh, do a lot of things on social media, mm. which creates obviously a certain awareness, not just for us, but obviously for the cause and for our mission. And I think governments, you know, could do much more, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in my opinion, now I understand that obviously they have multiple responsibilities for all kind of uh, inclusion um, areas. Mm-hmm. But I think we're certainly trying to push the envelope wherever we can. So talk to me a little bit about your approach to hiring. If we, we talk about sort of the candidate side here and the impact that has on your current employees who are on the spectrum, what were you guys doing around that? Yeah, so we designed a very specific recruitment process, which is different to what, you know, we would experience like as part of a neurotypical uh, recruitment process. So it's not the competency based interviews, driven, so it's a much more loose and much more practical and experience based. So, for example, coding challenges or mm-hmm. talk to me what you've done, you know, from sometimes very early on, like mm-hmm. from you know, 10, 11 or 12 uh, uh, age on. Yep. in terms of computer, right, or programming. And so we go through that and we have different chats, we call them. And then at the end of that process, we tend to have like a three-day, let's call it, workshop where we simulate a client situation and we build it around a case study. And so the individuals then form a team and they present back to me and I play the role of the you know, CEO. And uh, they present basically their recommendation to a real live um, business problem, business situation, and their recommendation. And as in any good case study, there's no right or wrong in terms of the answer. But what we want to see is, A, how they work as part of a team Mm -hmm. and how they derive to a particular recommendation. So what's their thought process? Mm -hmm. But in in return, they get obviously a lot of feedback in terms of how to write particular documentation, how to bring messages across, how to work optimal in the team. And we observe them actually while they do that. Mm -hmm. And Obviously, we had to put all of this online to do it remotely. It used to be all face-to-face, but uh, then we just developed a new process where everything is now remote. 
and it works fantastically well. And then subsequently, we basically make offers, um, and uh, we're trying to match that as close as possible to having client assignments. Um, as any good consulting company, you just have to be careful in terms of not having too many consultants on the beach, i.e. non-billable. <laughs> And then basically the real life starts in terms of the coaching and, uh, and the learning experience. But but that process typically takes yeah about two to three months in terms of identifying individuals and then uh, doing the chats and then putting the workshop, which happens every two months typically a workshop. And we're trying to have like five to seven individuals in each of the workshops. Now, in order to identify those individuals, a lot of them come to us because, you know, as a result of the social media and the articles we put out there. Mm -hmm. A fair bit of the candidates are introduced internally through like word of mouth. We did establish strong relationship with various medical professionals, so psychiatrists, psychologists, mm -hmm. universities. We established some good relationships with some autism associations, obviously state and national ones. And that, uh, and then we increasingly actually we started uh, developing a relationship with like uh, tertiary education organizations, because obviously they they're picking up a lot of uh, students, mm -hmm. and if there is basically one you know cases where they might be autistic, mm -hmm. then uh, they reach out, and so that establish another opportunity. So. No, I really like that. And I think there's a lot of what you're saying there that can apply to everyone, right? I, I think your approach yeah. to interviewing is great. I, I remember the. I don't think many people do this anymore, but the horrible behavioural questions, tell me a time when, and I'm so honest that I'll sit there something, but I don't have an exact example for that, but I've got lots of great things I can share. And I think, yeah, spending the time with people, giving them the right opportunity to show, you know, this is who I am, this is what I have to offer. And this is what, as you said, it looks like in a client situation. And the feedback we do get is like from all of our consultants, it's like, particularly after they join, it's like, it's like we, we found a family. Right? It's mm -hmm. a reference very often used. And I, and I like that reference a lot as well, because it's, it's a community of like-minded individuals who obviously shared a lot of similar experience, a lot of bad experience for that matter, before they came actually to us. If you look at the stats, I mean, you have the unemployment rate of autistic talent is like 34%, right? The underemployment rate is like 90%. So you have some really smart individuals who are completely underutilized because of a whole array of challenges they were exposed to, whether it was bullying or, you know, being accepted, being made redundant for all kinds of reasons. So suddenly they are obviously much more comfortable in their own skin. They're much more comfortable in their environment. A lot of the additional conditions, uh, well, they might not fall away completely, but they are subdued to in a very healthy sense. So the lack of depression, then uh, lack of anxiety, um, ADHD, a lot, a lot of those things, basically, while well, they might still be there, but they can mm -hmm. be managed in a much better way because you have the financial insecurity as well if you're unemployed, right? So. So suddenly they can play a very valuable part in society as well as like you know, mm. part of the family and uh, and certainly part of our ecosystem as well. So there's there's a lot of good things you can do. But coming back to the recruitment side, the very tailor-made and uh, autism-friendly approach certainly helps. But we still have the challenge in terms of when we talk to corporates, right? Because some of the corporates still have, obviously, they're used to that very neurotypical recruitment process. You know, there's a job description and they need to have 100% fit, et cetera. And if it would be nice to have an autistic person as well. So there's a lot of education I have to provide. This is not the way it works, right? Um, so we need to adjust your understanding and your process. And we certainly do that as part of the training, but it's not just HR, it's the technology side as well. And so ideally it needs to come from both sides. Which comes back to the equity conversation, doesn't it? Which I think a lot of people don't realise that those very traditional recruitment practices just aren't fair to everyone. Yeah. And even though they think, well, we give everyone the, the same recruitment process, but some people that it just doesn't work. And then, as you said, they're missing out on talent. And I think the other thing I'd just pick up from what you were saying there is just on the candidate side, giving people this purpose, you know, in a, in a role that really supports them can transform lives. Yeah. It really can, can't uh, it? Absolutely. And I'm just thinking of you had a very interesting guest as part of the uh, roundtable the other day who mm. is focusing on making sure that the feedback and the response is handled accordingly and properly as well. And while this is just a, a detail as part of the overall recruitment program, but it is, it's brutally important, right? Because, um, we all, we all have been in these situations when we applied and we didn't get no response or a very short, uh, a shortly drafted one. So I think 
There are different aspects, I agree. And I think, you know, common sense to just put yourself in the shoes of the other individuals, right? Whether it's the one who applies uh, or the candidate who speaks. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, autism is a particular field with, uh, you know, particular challenges. But there's a lot of value in there if it's done right. There's no question, right? And we do get that feedback now for the last mm -hmm. 11 years, right? So... We're speaking with Bodo Mann, the CEO and MD of Autocon in Australia and New Zealand, and we'll be back on the other side of this break. And we're back with Bodo. We've been talking about the really amazing work your organisation is doing, and, and we're just touching there on recruitment and, you know, how to kind of challenge the status quo of recruitment to make it more equitable and inclusive for people who are on the autism spectrum. Just to finish our conversation today, what I'd really love to touch on is how you really set your employees up for success with their future employers. I know you do a lot of work to make sure that this works for everyone. So I think we have a few aspects to that. Uh, obviously, we, as part of the recruitment process, which is very autism friendly, we answer a lot of the questions. We prepare them for what might come. That's one. Once they're hired, um, we will put them through additional training. Some is basically, you know, social, if you want some is more technical training, some is behavioral or in terms of how what to expect in a client environment. But we also ask our clients to invest. Right? And that happens probably, you know, at least 60, 70% of the time. Let's say there's a particular testing role uh, where Tosca, for argument's sake, is the testing software is required. Mm. And uh, we, basically training is provided. Um, we do a lot of cybersecurity courses. Uh, we do also some quality assurance uh, certificates, which we put individuals through. And we provide sufficient time that they can do that, um, basically, while they're uh, during while, while they're uh, working for clients. So that's one. The more they are in real-time and real-world employment, mm -hmm. um, obviously, their own confidence grows as well over time, right? Um, so, we, which is half of the success, as we all know, like success is a mind game. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you feel you contribute, if you feel successful, mm -hmm. that is important because it wasn't the case before where they just didn't have that uh, support or the the, the, the they couldn't have the, build the confidence. So, so I think it's really a combination of we provide training, clients provide training, mm. and we also endeavor, I talked about the four verticals, we endeavor that all consultants are proficient in two of those four verticals. And we want to have them rotating mm -hmm. uh, across different clients over time. Mm -hmm. The assignments are typically, you know, long term. So, you know, one, two, three years. But wherever we can, we just try to rotate them out and allow them to gain additional client experience as well as content experience, uh, project experience. And ideally, two out of the four verticals, we want to you know, make them really proficient. Which really, I guess, sets them up for future success, you know, beyond the work that they're doing with you guys. And I imagine yeah. that's part of your purpose. Uh, absolutely right, right? And of course, like, you know, they could be anytime uh, poached by our clients or they could they could resign and go somewhere else, right? That's mm -hmm. absolutely. It doesn't happen very often. Simply, we've talked about this family context before, mm -hmm. and it is really a closely knit community. Um, and they form friendships as well, right? So, um, but in theory, absolutely. And the whole point is creating, you know, meaningful opportunities, mm -hmm. whether they're with us or outside. So, absolutely. I think you're, you're doing amazing work and I'll get some links from you um, after our conversation that we can basically publish with this podcast so that if people are interested either on the client side or the candidate side that they know how to get in touch with you. Thank you very much. Absolute well, pleasure you. having you on today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. I'd also like to say a big thank you to our listeners for joining us today. If you have enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts as it helps other HR and people leaders to discover and enjoy this show. If there are any topics you would like us to cover, please reach out to me at editor at hrleader.com.au. And of course, please make sure you're subscribed to HR Leader. You can do that on our website at hrleader.com.au. Thank you again, Bodo. Fantastic. Thank you so much.